the personal injury law show. This show that talks about everything current in the law of personal injuries and how it relates to you, the viewer. My name's Tony Carbone. I'm a personal injury lawyer of over 25 years experience. With me today, I've got John Carantis, a partner in a law firm. Good evening, John. Hi, Tony. Hi, viewers. And Don Mafia, a partner in a law firm. Good evening, Don. Good evening, Tony. Good evening, viewers. And viewers, tonight we've got a very interesting subject about how genetic testing can discriminate against you when you apply for insurance, superannuation, and the like. So stay tuned for the episode. How, however, before that, Tony, what's in the news? Oh, John, there's been a lot said about the changes to the Transport Accident Commission legislation to deal with nervous shock and psych cases. In fact, it's on the back of one of their biggest profits. It was $973 million. The government picked up a dividend of $173 million. There's been no announcement to reduce premiums. In fact, they keep going up every year. And so mm. what do they do? They mm. change the system. system what actually, are the main changes, Don? The, one of the main changes is they're making it very difficult, in fact, I say impossible, for people who sustain psychiatric injuries to make a claim for their damages, a pain and suffering income loss. And John, what is the definition? Can you actually follow it or Tony, can you understand Tony, it? Tony, this is the most convoluted definition I've ever seen, I've ever come across. A Supreme Court judge is going to have difficulty going through this. The TAC want to literally abolish common law rights for people to sue for their psychological claims arising out of a transport accident. So that's, that's what it comes down to. Tony, it's three paragraphs. In essence, a person has a long-term severe mental impairment if they, ha if they uh, and this is how it reads, for a continuous period of at least three years has a recognised mental illness or disorder other than abnormal illness as a result of a transport accident and displays symptoms and consequent disability that have not responded or have substantially failed to respond to known effective clinical treatments. You're still following because sure. I've already lost, been lost, but anyway, provided by a registered mental health professional who is registered under the Health Practitioner Regulations, Tony. So that's a new one. And has severely impaired function with symptoms causing clinically significant distress and severe impairment in relationships and social and vocational functioning. Tony, what's the, what does it mean? Well, John, it sounds to me and viewers, it's an inclusive test. If you don't have all those factors covered off, that is, if you don't have three years of medical treatment by a registered medical practitioner, a psychiatrist, and you don't take medication for three years, Don, and you don't have an effect on your social, recreational and working life, working life, mind you, yes. so it effectively probably excludes well, Tony, let's retirees put it, and children. Let's, let's put it perspective children. for the viewers. If you're a retiree with psychological conditions, you're out. If you're a stay-at-home mum, you're out. If you're a child, you're out. You can't claim. So, so if it's, you're it's, not working... You don't have a right. You cannot excluded. satisfy... By looking at this definition, you cannot satisfy that in, definition. In essence, they've raised the bar so high that anyone will never be able to claim a, a psychological claim for lump sum compensation yeah. in a transport accident. If Tony, John, this is probably the start. Tony, if they get away with this, the next area they'll attack is probably work cover or work Tony, safe. Is that Tony, correct? this is akin to what Jeff Kennett did in the early 90s when he abolished common law rights for work cover claimants. They're doing this in a slot, insidious way now. The TAC are doing this in a very insidious way, literally abolishing common law rights for psychological claims in a transport accident. The government is on notice that there will be a campaign against them about this. And remember what happened to Jeff Kennett, Tony? Oh, yeah, yeah. he lost and, the and, election. And he lost yeah. the election. And this is a Liberal government that, oh, by the way, the Liberals did this 15 years ago. Exactly. Tony, Je by the way, Jeff Kennett, he's head of that Beyond Blue organisation. He is. A That's psychological right. Well, he should be involved uh, in the campaign what's against his, this. What's his view about this? I, I ask him, he should come out in the public and, you know, and say something about this. It's, it's just not no, right, Tony. No, it's not. This has gone too far. And to put, again, to put another perspective, all those people involved in Kerrang, the witnesses, people involved who had severe psychological harm and distress, under this definition, 
a lot of them will not make it. Mm. So they Don, will not get compensated. The, the Kerrang, that was the, uh, the, the train The train crash crash and, and the Mildura. Mildura. Um, so is this, is this new legislation all about those claims? Not necessarily, because there was only about 90 claims, John. Well, that's a yeah, lot well, of claims. They're saying, look... Oh, well, yes and no, I mean, all up... For the TA system... 1,200 no. serious injuries last year, John. And 90 were side Not cases. psychological. Yes. No, but, but 90 again, were is that, shock cases. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. is this an overreaction by the government, by the TSA yeah, and the minister? So. They believe they're going to save 35 million, mm. but by the time you uh, start looking at the litigation my, that flows from this... My understanding is the government and the TAC were very annoyed with all the litigation done by uh, the Karen case and the Mildura case, and this is a byproduct of it, Don. Well, I think it's just... Clear that they just don't like their psychological psychiatric condition. So and if you've got a psychological psychiatric condition resulting from a transport accident, hmm. you've been discriminated and, against. And on top of this, the minister, Gordon Rich Phillips, is misleading the public saying that the SES workers and the emergency workers have work cover entitlements. Well, no. If it's arising out of a transport accident, they don't have common law work cover entitlements. Do they, t uh, Don? No, they won't. Do they, they would not satisfy. No. It is pos impossible to satisfy the, this definition. The minister, the minister is misleading <clears throat> the public saying that and he should retract that. And furthermore, it's done without consultation again and instead of saying to the lawyers and the public, you know, let's have your view about how the definition should be framed, they've gone off and written it themselves, gone through uh, the lower house of parliament twice, second reading speech, and the crazy. definition talks about it's an inclusive and, 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 not as opposed to and, or, and, or, and, or. Mm. Look, let's talk about an example of how it affects people. This uh, Rowan Moore was involved in a serious accident with his family. The wife was pregnant, mm. Don. The baby finally died. Yeah. They've both suffered severe psychiatric, psychological injuries. What happens from there, Don? Under this definition, they won't get entitled to any compensation. And don't... This definition, according to the TAC and the Minister, it was prepared by the, the consultative chief psychiatrist. Mm. But yet, we don't know who the chief psychiatrist is of uh, the medical board. No. But then all these psychiatrists, practising psychiatrists, are now writing to the TAC and to the government saying this definition is not workable. No, it's not workable. So who is this chief psychiatrist? In fact, he's Don unknown. He's John unknown. He's unknown. All of TAC refused to tell us, Tony. All the eminent psychiatrists out there, people that have been involved in transport accident cases for many years, have said that the definition's unworkable. And in fact, quite a few of them have written letters to the minister already. Yeah. And there's been protests, John. Well, there's Dr. been Strauss campaigns. Has, yes. And Look, uh, we'll have to come back to this story in the future because obviously it's just the start of the oh, whole. It's, it's the start of a campaign to not allow the government to abolish common law rights in psychological transport accident claims. Study. On the back of a billion dollar profit. That's exactly. the worst part about it. That's exactly. the part that really gets me. Exactly. And plus, this is the starting point. If they touch the transport accident legislation, what comes next, John? Who knows? Well, exactly. this, and this definition clearly does not take into account the ebbs and flows, the ups and downs of a psychological exactly. condition. Exactly. So, Look, we'll come back to this. Viewers, stay tuned. After the break, we'll be talking to Tim Vines there's some Civil Liberties Australia about genetic testing and its impact on insurance and superannuation claims. So don't go away. Welcome back to the show. Tonight we're talking about genetic discrimination and how genetic testing impacts on your life insurance and other insurance and also your employment situation. In the studio tonight I've got Nunzio Tartaglia as well, another Tony, lawyer. viewers, welcome. And also Tim Vines, Civil Liberties Australia, on Skype from Canberra. Good evening, Tim. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Tim... Tell us a bit about your role. What does your um, association do? Sure. Uh, so Civil Liberties Australia is a uh, national organisation 
that looks after uh, well, the rights and civil liberties of all Australians. So it, we look at things like government legislation, the actions of police and bureaucrats, and how those are impacting upon the way in which we, we live our lives, essentially. Uh, we look at legislation that's coming before parliaments and make submissions and try and improve the legislation. And obviously we try and engage uh, with the community in forums like this in order to let people know about topics of interest or things that impact upon their civil liberties and their rights that they might not know about. Nunce, why is this an important issue, that is genetic testing? Oh, well, Tony, look, it's obviously becoming uh, more of a prevalent issue and I'm, I'm assuming as, as the years go on and technology enhances, it's going to be even more. And Look, basically, genetic discrimination is when an employer or a company effectively treats someone differently because of their, you know, assumed genetic makeup or just the, the genetic makeup. And um, look, Tim, you know, can you explain to the viewers, I suppose, uh, I suppose the evolution of, of genetic discrimination? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I'm not sure how much viewers know about uh, genetics in general because it's a, it's a fairly complicated area. But um, in essence. Just a brief recap is that your DNA um, is pretty much the, the book of your life, book of life. It, it sets out um, a lot of things around how your body is going to develop, how it's going to change over time, um, and, in and in some cases it can set, uh, determine what sort of diseases you're more susceptible to inheriting. So cancer can be linked to certain mutations in the genome. Um, Genetic discrimination is really the same as all forms of discrimination. It's forming a prejudice against someone not based on their performance, but actually based upon some um, supposed weakness or limitation that, that, that they might have. So for racial discrimination, that's because of the particular type of race and you bring racial stereotypes to how you think that they're going to work. Uh, for genetic discrimination, it's really what sort of diseases, conditions, um, uh, or even behaviours you think that someone's going to exhibit. And because of that, you don't look at the person, you don't treat them as an individual, you merely um, you know, cast them off as uh, not worthy to provide service to or to employ. John, what protections do we ha currently have against genetic discrimination and other forms of discrimination in, say, Victoria, for example? Well, we're talking about organisations that will try to really, in essence, Tony, get your uh, DNA fingerprint, your genetic uh, makeup. Now, uh, at the moment, the laws are quite clear. Uh, the individual is not required to provide you know, their genetic d DNA to any organisation. However, uh, of course, that can slightly change in a criminal context, can't it, Tony? When, it, it can. when fingerprints it can. are taken and DNA testing is taken in the in the criminal sphere, isn't the real problem, John Nunce yep. and Tim, that if you've subjected yourself to some sort of test, whether it be genetic or not, you have to disclose that to an insurance company? Uh, yes, that's um, that's true. In in Australia, there's a rule where um, if you're seeking life insurance or certain other types of insurance, you have to tell the person, the insurer, anything that's relevant to them providing you cover. So at the moment in Australia, a insurer, say a life insurer, will not ask you to take a genetic test. But if you've used one of the many online services, um, say 23andMe, even out of curiosity, just to see, oh, I wonder if I have this particular gene that's prevalent in my family, um, then regardless of what the results are and regardless of what you intended to do with those results, then yes, you have to tell your life insurer uh, if, say, it came back saying that you have a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's or if you have a higher risk of developing cancer. Nunce, you've had examples mm. in the past where you've had clients that have failed to disclose certain information that they were privy to. How has that impacted or affected their claims? Well, effectively, Tony, the, the insurance company can effectively cut, you know, cut their insurance or, or not approve any insurance if you've not properly disclosed your, your past conditions. And I'm interested to ask, Tim, so what's your view if, if there has been some DNA testing in a, a certain claimant's family uh, and they're aware of, uh, I suppose, a predisposition to some sort of condition? 
are you saying that uh, they shouldn't need to disclose it or are you saying that it shouldn't need to be relied upon? Well, I think that it's um, really a question of reliability. We are, you know, we're still really at a very early stage in understanding how our genetics actually play out in real life. Um, at the time of the Human Genome Project back in 2001, we thought, look, we've now got the, the book of life. We now know it all. We should now be able to have some really good treatments that target diseases. We should understand the link between genes and diseases. And that's not been the case. In fact, we now realize that that view was naive, um, that there are all sorts of things at play, most important of which is actually your environment. It's how you, it's the food you eat, the lifestyle you live. Um, it can even be what happens to you while you're in your mother's womb. Those things can have as big an impact, if not bigger, on what diseases you have than your genetic makeup. So for an insurance company to rely upon this type of information as its sole ground in deciding whether you should um, be granted a, a policy or not, we think it's very premature, that there's just not enough reliability around this. And insurance companies, I think, understand this at the moment. T it's Tim, just about whether they move on. A very high-profile um, individual, Angelina Jolly, recently had mastectomies because her mother and grandmother died of breast cancer. That would be a case where an insurance company could rely on genetic testing to exclude, say, breast cancer, for example. Because, I mean, she's obviously the link there is pretty strong, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's, that's a very interesting case, actually, of Angelina Jolie. So she has what is called a mutation in either the BRCA1 or BRCA2. So they're the breast cancer, um, breast cancer genes, essentially. And um, if you have a mutation in one or both of those, a certain type of mutation, it increases your chance of developing breast or ovarian cancer um, significantly. In the case of breast cancer, it can be, it can, you can actually have a 70% chance of developing it, not just a 70% increase, but a 70% chance of developing it. So one question would be that um, uh, there are two things that come out of this. First, even though that this particular gene has a very strong link, there are, say, other ethnic populations where the studies haven't shown that the mutation causes such a significant increase. Um, so you can have variability across populations. So even though Angelina Jolie considered herself at risk, say a person who is of, um, uh, say, Chinese background, um, someone who is of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background, they have a ge different genetic profile. Mutations okay. mean different things for them. So discrimination can still occur where we say, well, Angelina Jolie represents all women in Australia. Um, I'm not sure that all women in Australia would like to be held up to that particular standard, but um, uh, you can still have issues there of discrimination. Viewers, we've got to go to a sponsor's break, so please stay tuned. We'll take up this conversation just after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. We're talking with Tim Vines and the panel in relation to genetic testing and its effect on insurance, your employment and other things. Tim, there is an exclusion, Section 46 of the Disability Discrimination Act, Commonwealth 1992, has got a, a, uh, an exclusion there where the insurers can discriminate against an individual. Um, so, I mean, there are a couple of things around that. The Commonwealth Act uh, defines disability so um, that it includes future and imputed disability. And that means that things that are perhaps linked to your genetic profile or family behaviour that people might think runs in the family can constitute a disability that you're protected from discrimination on the basis of. Um, as you say, though, there is an exemption there for certain types of insurers. Um, but even there, they have to make sure that if they're going to raise a premium or deny coverage on the basis of a genetic test, that that's reasonable to do, that they have the evidence that supports the link between a genetic mutation 
and a disease, and that that link is so strong that it would be actually reasonable to, um, to deny coverage. Something worth mentioning, though, is that in Australia, a private health insurer is not allowed to charge you a higher premium um, or to deny you cover on the basis of your genetic test. And that's because of the Private Health Insurance Act, which mandates what's called a form of community rating. So whether you're a smoker, whether you like um, bungee jumping, whether you just sit behind a desk all day, you all pay the same premium um, if you're within the same fund and you're opting for the same sort of level of cover. Um, it's only for life insurance and maybe certain other products um, that might come with your superannuation where there may be, uh, where that exemption may actually apply. Tim, just, look, you mentioned that obviously uh, the insurance companies have made a, a public statement that they're not going to undertake any DNA t testing uh, with respect to, to coverage for, for claimants, but where do you think it's going to head? Do you, do you think it's heading to, in that direction? What's, I suppose, the, the, the talk around the town about it? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, at the moment, as you say, there's essentially a gentleman's agreement between the big insurers that they're not going to require a genetic test um, before, they offer, before they offer cover. Um, that said, as we've already discussed, if you go out and get a test on your own, then you have to disclose those, those results if they're relevant. Um, where are we going to go in the future? Well, look, um, 12 years ago, it cost um, many billions of dollars and uh, a decade's worth of computer and scientist effort to actually sequence a, an individual's genome. Now we can do it in a couple of days, and in a few years, it's going to be less than $1,000 to sequence someone's genome. Some insurers may consider that that's actually, you know, now reached a, a certain cost break mm. point where they will start requiring genetic, um, genetic testing, especially in the case perhaps of certain high um, payout um, policies or perhaps where they believe that a certain um, group of people are likely to actually carry a mutation that will have a material impact on their insurance. Tim, the, uh, the position in America is different, isn't it? In America, it, it's different, and it certainly was very different until um, some of the healthcare reform was there. Because in the United States, unlike here, your private health insurer, or just your health insurer, could refuse coverage on the basis of, um, of so-called pre-existing conditions. And there were some ridiculous cases where infants were denied coverage because they were born a little bit overweight. Um, and, and I understand in America, there's various employers that require new job applicants to undergo a DNA test. Well, in yeah, that's well, and they also do all sorts of testing for other for other things as well, like drug and urine testing. So genetic testing wouldn't surprise me. What's interesting, though, is that in the United States, there's a piece of legislation. It's the Genetic um, Information Non Discrimination Act, or the, the GINA Act, and that is supposed to um, prevent genetic discrimination over there. What we found quite interesting in Australia was that um, the our Discrimination Act prevents genetic discrimination. But some of the reforms that were being proposed at the beginning of the year um, actually maybe left open the possibility that genetic discrimination could occur uh, because the definition of disability was being amended in such a way that those future and imputed and potential disabilities were no longer explicitly covered by the legislation. Tim, that, that act that you just mentioned earlier in the year, that, that's the Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Bill that the Gillard government introduced, is that, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, so where has that gone to? Because uh, obviously uh, it got a lot of public exposure at the time. Where is it at, at now? So that was the exposure draft that was released earlier, um, earlier in the year, and I think it's now back with the Attorney General's Department, who will probably review the feedback they had. But really now it will depend on the new government and whether they decide to proceed with it. Certainly their focus when they were um, coming out against it was not about the changes in definitions to disability, it was rather about some of the um, wording around racial vilification mm. and particular types of speech. Um, but given their hostility to it when it was first introduced, it's not likely to make an appearance anytime soon. Tim, have you got an example of someone that's been discriminated against by virtue of their genetic makeup? In an yeah, insurance... so the best example that we have at the moment was of a New South Wales policeman, um, and his brother uh, was involved in a was involved in an assault and and died. And um, it was discovered during the inquiry into that that um, he 
had uh, sickle cell anemia, which is an uh, inheritable condition. Now, that didn't contribute to the brother's death, but the police um, employers were like, well, if he had it, then you probably have it. So they took him off active duty. They prohibited him from wearing his police uniform outside of work, Absolutely. driving marked police cars, um, and he sued on the basis that this was discrimination. And he won in the, um, the federal court, or in the, um, uh, the federal magistrate's court, because the, the magistrate clearly believed that this was actually going way beyond what um, was reasonable. Tim, we'll have to take up this discussion in the future because obviously time goes pretty quick. John, if anyone's in this situation, what do you suggest they do? Tony, firstly, if you're not required as a new job applicant or under an insurance contract to undergo a DNA test. No. At the same time, if you've already undergone a DNA test, you have to dis disclose it, don't you, Tony? Exactly. You have to yeah. act reasonably. If you, at, and again, at the same time, if you're uh, applying for a superannuation or TPD insurance and you know you've, there's a family history of a certain condition, you'd probably have to uh, disclose or it, don't you, Tony? more importantly, you're going to have to disclose anything that's pertinent, like let's say you might have a reflux condition yep. or you might have a, yes. a predisposition to a nasty, uh, to a back. You might have scoliosis. Mm. You'd have to disclose all those, wouldn't you, Nons? Yeah, look, I, I, I say that with these superannuation policies, you've, uh, you know, safety first, and you may as well put more than less, to be honest, because um, it, it's, it's not going to hurt you in that regard. Tim, thanks for coming on the show. John, Nons, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, guys. Viewers, thanks for watching. Don't forget to go to our website. Also, go to past episodes. Stay tuned for future episodes, and always remember to stay safe.